All right, everyone, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes, Dr. Curtis, we can hear you. Okay, awesome. So we're about to start. Uh, we have a speaker here. Um, I will, I have the honor of uh, welcoming uh, Dr. Chipiza with us. She's about to share her link and she will do the first section uh, of the morning, the lecture on hypofractionation from the clinical standpoint. Uh, just as a way of introduction, Dr. Fallon Chipiza was born and raised in Zimbabwe before moving to the United States to, uh, to complete her college. She received a medical degree from Harvard Medical School. She completed her internship at the Massachusetts General Hospital um, before completing her training in um, radiation oncology at the Harvard Radiation Oncology Residency Program. Um, her clinical interests are, breast, are primary in breast and lung cancer, and she has an academic focus in global oncology. She's a clinical instructor in radiation oncology at Harvard Medical School, and she sees patients at um, Brigham and Women Hospital, as well as Dana Faber Cancer Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. Please welcome with us uh, Dr. Fallon Chipiza. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, creditor, for that generous introduction. Um, let me just share my screen here and let me know if you can see my slides. So, present a moment. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. yes. Oh, okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, so again, you know, my name is Fallon. Um, I'm a radiation oncologist here at um, Brigham and Dana Faber. Um, I'm actually originally from Zimbabwe, that's where I grew up, and I'm really excited to be part of this panel, um, and many thanks to the organizers for inviting me, it's always a pleasure to be here, um, and um, this is a two-part series lecture that I'm co-presenting with Jackie, who will go after me, um, but I think when I start presenting, if you have any questions, you know, just raise up your hand or feel free to chime in and want it to be as interactive as, as much as possible. Um, and then at the end, I'll make sure that I make these slides available uh, if it will be helpful. So I will send them to the organizers and they can share. Uh, and I'll also make sure if anybody wants to reach out by email, uh, feel free to connect with me via email as well. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, I know we're starting a little bit behind schedule. So I do not have any relevant financial disclosures. Um, and this is the outline that we'll you know, go over today. As I mentioned, uh, we have two parts. The first part is more um, on the clinical background, which I will be covering. And then for part two, it's more the technical aspects and dosimetry, uh, which Jackie will go over. So for part one, um, maybe we'll start with a few cases that we can look at. Um, and then my plan is to go over, you know, hypofractionation and, you know, we're talking about breast cancer today. I know there are other lectures in the series that will cover other disease sites. So for today, I will focus strictly on breast cancer. So we'll look at some of the, the data and the evidence that's there. We'll review some cases. Um, my focus today will be on early stage breast cancer. I'm not going to spend too much time on, you know, high risk uh, in the high risk setting or post mastectomy. But I'll just touch on it very briefly at the end. So I think um, we have about 40 minutes uh, and then feel free to, to chime in um, at any point. Uh, so let's start maybe with a case. Um, so this is case one. Um, it's a patient A, so she's a 43 year old woman. Um, who was found on a screening mammogram to have a 1.7 centimeter left breast mass. Uh, she underwent, you know, all the typical workup, um, and then ultimately she underwent a lumpectomy uh, and a sentinel lymph node biopsy. So her final pathology uh, demonstrated a 17 millimeter uh, invasive ductal carcinoma. It was grade three. There was no lymphovascular invasion. Margins were negative and none of the sentinel lymph nodes were positive. Her tumor was estrogen and progesterone receptor positive, her two negative. Um, her oncotype was tested, it came back at seven, uh, so no indication for chemotherapy. So her overall stage is T1C and zero stage 1A. So just to get you guys to, to think, I'm not going to poll you or you know, have you raise your hands, but maybe we can just 
kind of pause, you know, for a couple of seconds and look at, you know, some of the different treatment options that are listed here, they're, you know, they fall into basically six buckets, you know. So for this patient, you know, option A, you know, if you were meeting this patient as their radiation oncologist, um, you know, how would you kind of approach their treatment? You know, would you do A, which is, you know, the conventional fractionation, you know, with or without a boost? Or, you know, options B and C are, you know, three-week courses of, you know, moderate hypofractionation, and we'll talk about that in a second, uh, with or without a boost? Or would you consider doing, you know, what we now call ultra or extreme hypofractionation, um, which is just five fractions of radiation that you can do either in one week or you do it over five weeks delivering a single fraction. And then, you know, um, the other bucket, in, you know, the last option there is, there are obviously uh, many different ways of treating, you know, breast cancer patients, would you consider, you know, doing maybe a different, uh, you know, schema, a different regimen? Um, or would you consider other things like partial breast irradiation? Or would you consider not treating this patient? Um, I hope not. So, you know, just think through these questions and, and maybe consider what, what would be your recommendation. So this is case one. And then we can go to case two. Um, which is patient B now. Um, she's 74 years old. She had the screening mammogram and she had a much smaller breast primary. It was six millimeters. Um, and she subsequently underwent a lumpectomy. Uh, she did not have a sentinel lymph node done, uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy done. Uh, and then her final pathology is shown here, six millimeters invasive ductal carcinoma, grade one no LVI margins were negative. And again, this is hormone receptor positive, uh, same stage as the previous patient as well. So the treatment options are exactly the same as the previous slide. Um, but just in thinking about this, you know, uh, what, would you, what would you consider for this patient? Um, and um, creditor, please let me know. I can't see my, my, the chat window when I'm, in the presenter mode. So if there are any questions or anything like that, um, just let me know. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you. So um, yeah, I do see that the comments are coming in through um, and that's great, uh, great thoughts. Um, let's see here. Yeah, a lot of people, you know, commenting you wouldn't do um, no radiation. So yeah. Um, that's great. Looks like a lot of people are actually favoring option C, um, which is great. So for this case, so let's um, move forward. So um, maybe for the next couple of minutes, we can focus a little bit on, you know, hypofractionation and look at some of the data. Uh, now that we've looked at those two cases, um, just to start the, the conversation. Um, so just to give um, a little bit of background, you know, so for breast cancer, you know, historically decades ago, we, we were doing radical mastectomies, then we shifted the paradigm, we started doing modified radical mastectomies. Uh, and then about 30 years ago, uh, we actually did large trials that compared, you know, modified radical mastectomy to breast conserving surgery, what we call lumpectomy, uh, with the addition of radiation. Uh, in those initial trials that were done, um, we, the patients were treated with conventional fractionation, which is, um, you know, and they were treated to, you know, 50 gray and 25 fractions, which, you know, what we call the, the conventional fractionation here. And, um, you know, the rationale back in those days is we were beginning to understand the interaction of, you know, radiation and, and radiobiology. Initially, it was thought that tumors had a lower um, alpha beta ratio, uh, sorry, had a higher alpha beta ratio, uh, and therefore not sensitive um, to fractionation. So, you know, an alpha beta ratio is sort of like a marker of how sensitive a tumor or a normal tissue is to the size of the fraction. So the higher the ratio, the less sensitive it is, you know, it doesn't matter whether you do you know, two grade per fraction over 10 grade per fraction. Um, 
and that was the original understanding, but with additional research, um, we started to understand that some adenocarcinomas such as breast cancer or prostate cancer, uh, they probably had a lower alpha beta ratio than what was historically understood. So much lower implying that maybe they were in fact more sensitive to the fraction size. So if you were to increase the fraction size, perhaps you could um, have more uh, tumor control. So that was sort of like the background to that you know, prompted a lot of these trials that have looked at um, um, hypofractionation. So just for, you know, this is the definitions are not, you know, black and white, but this is just sort of like the three buckets, the way I approach this. Uh, so anything that is, you know, in the 1.82 grade, that's the historical conventional fractionation. And then uh, moderate hypofractionation is when you deliver fractions that are in the, you know, 2.5 to 3 uh, gray range. And then um, in most recently with the latest data that we have, um, you know, fraction sizes that are greater than five, that would be considered, you know, some people call it ultra hypofractionation, some people call it extreme hypofractionation. Um, and in any case, this is important, you know, for, for us oncologists and, you know, for many of you guys who are taking care of patients, let's say in, in, in areas where the demand is higher than the resources, um, being able to deliver a bigger fraction size obviously results in shorter treatment time. It increases access to care. It's convenient for patients. And uh, overall, um, you know, the cost, the healthcare costs of delivering care are much lower. So that's just a little bit of background on, you know, why we do this and where did this come from and why are we doing it uh, in the first place? Um, so, you know, for, for today, you know, I will look at, uh, I'm just going to kind of go over and review four of the key trials uh, that we look at, you know, there are many, many trials, uh, and, and this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but I'm sort of highlighting the large trials that have included, you know, thousands of patients, you know, multi-institutional and uh, obviously randomized. Um, so we'll kind of go over these, uh, but this is just a summary of what each of those trials you know, kind of looked at and what they compared. Um, so I mentioned, you know, the, the original trials, um, the NSABP trials, you know, from the 80s, you know, they had used 50 gray in 25 fractions. So that's sort of like the baseline, the standard. Uh, so we're going to look at four trials. The first one is the Canadian, uh, which was published, you know, at this point, it's been 12 years since this data came out. Uh, there had been a number of phase one and phase two trials prior to this, um, but, you know, the, this was sort of like one of the original, you know, prospective trials that was published uh, on this topic. Uh, and then around the same time, you know, there were two parallel studies that were being done in the UK. Uh, in fact, you know, the, the three trials that are listed on this slide, they were all done uh, in the UK. So in the UK, there were two parallel trials that were done, you know, called the START A and the START B trials. Um, and they were also looking at, you know, what was the standard at that time, which is the 50 gray um, in 25 fractions. But in the A trial, they used a slightly different schema. Um, they treated their patients in about 13 fractions. And all these trials are trying to kind of tweak and find the sweet spot in terms of radiobiology, trying to kind of make the right uh, assumptions about the alpha beta ratio. The difference between the, the START A and B trials compared to the Canadian trial is that the UK studies actually allowed um, the patients to have a boost, which wasn't allowed in the, in the Canadian regimen. And these trials also included um, a small number of patients who had had a mastectomy, whereas in the Canadian study, all the patients had just had a lapectomy. So those were the, the original trials. And around the same time that the, the START trials were being done in the UK, um, they were also doing um, extreme hypofractionation. They were also exploring extreme hypofractionation. So uh, in 2011, they published their first trial, uh, which was randomized. Uh, so the UK FAST trial, which I kind of think in my head, you know, FAST1, um, was looking again at the standard at that time, you know, 50 gray, 25 fractions, 
but they kind of pushed the envelope a little bit and, and tried to compress the treatment even further from you know, the three weeks that was looked at in the Canadian trial and the start trials to just delivering the treatment over five fractions. So the original FAST trial was looking at, um, you know, uh, extreme hyperfractionation, but the treatment was delivered once a week. So patients would come for five weeks, but they were getting uh, just five fractions. And again, you'll see here that they were sort of experimenting with different assumptions of the alpha beta ratio that I talked about earlier. So, you know, half of the people in the experimental arm, uh, they got 5.7 gray uh, times five. And then the other half, you know, they got uh, six gray times five. Um, I'm just going to pause. I see there's a question here. Uh, so there's a question from uh, Jalil, uh, how type of fractionation code if between 3.1 is that still moderate? I would still call that moderate. So the question was if the fraction size is between 3.1 and 4.9, is that still considered moderate? Um, like I said, these are, you know, the definitions that I put are not black and white. This is sort of like a moving target. At this point in time in 2022, that sort of the, the general definitions that we're using, but obviously that's that's shifting. Um, so um, so that was the FAST1 trial from 2011. Um, and then, you know, this was a very conveniently timed trial, the fourth one that's lifted here, that's listed here. Um, the, the second FAST trial, which is called the FAST Forward trial, which is slightly different from the original one, was published two months after uh, we were in the pandemic. So the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, you know, started around December 2019 and, you know, by February, almost the whole world was in lockdown. So this trial, it was published in the Lancet, you know, two months after that is just as we were all trying to figure out how to manage our clinics and, and you know, optimize cancer care, but with the challenges of the pandemic. So, so that's the UK fast forward trial and we'll talk about that as well. Um, but in the fast forward trials as opposed to the fast trial from 2011, um, they were looking at uh, doing all of the treatment in just one week instead of five weeks. And again, they were tweaking with the uh, alpha beta ratio. Um, so one group got 5.2 gray uh, times five and then they had another group that got 5.4 you know, very subtle differences, but we will look at the data and see um, how that actually makes a difference. Um, so we'll move forward. So we'll kind of look at these four trials um, and then I want to keep an eye on the clock here. It's 9.25. So, um, so this is the data from the Canadian trial uh, and these are their results, you know, published originally in the New England Journal in 2011 and in the Canadian trial, I think as you know, most of us know at this point, um, they included all the patients with early stage, you know, breast cancer, they excluded patients who were large breasted or had a wider separation. And when they looked at their data with 10 years of follow up, there was no difference. Um, you know, suggesting and, and demonstrating actually improving the hypothesis that the alpha beta ratio of breast cancers is much lower than other cancers like, you know, squamous cells, you know, um, or early responding normal tissues. Um, and there was no difference in any additional outcomes. So in terms of um, cancer control, there was no difference. And they also looked at, you know, outcomes in terms of toxicity which is the, the bottom uh, two rows here. And you can see there was this, these are subtle differences and they were not even statistically uh, significant. And this trial was designed as a non-inferiority trial. Um, and the conclusion you know, from these results was, um, you know, hypofractionation is not inferior uh, to what we had considered to be the standard. Around the time when this uh, data was published, only about five to maybe 7% of centers in the US were, were doing hypofractionation. But obviously when this data came out, um, you know, the, the practice changed and fast forward today, you know, this, this is now the standard. So the 16 fraction. And in the Canadian trial, 
um, they did, um, you know, planned subgroup analysis, you know, by different variables, you know, regardless of age, tumor size, you know, the um, estrogen receptor status, whether or not the patient received systemic therapy, there were no differences. Um, so this was a, a practice changing trial. Um, and, you know, within a couple of years of this trial being published, we went from having 5% of the centers doing this type of vaccination to, you know, more than 50%. And today, obviously, I think nearly all centers consider this to be a standard. So um, very exciting results when this came out. Um, and then similarly, you know, three years later, um, the START A and START B trials had been published, you know, a little bit prior to um, the Canadian trial. But in, in 2013, they grouped the results from, you know, both groups. And so the pooled analysis, you know, was published around the same time that the study by Tim Whalen in Canada had been published. And um, you can see here, this is just, a, you know, highlighting their, their findings and their results. Um, this patient population was slightly more heterogeneous compared to the Canadian study. Like I mentioned, you know, they included patients who had had a mastectomy um, and, you know, they also treated nodes and they included boosts. But regardless of those, you know, they, when they looked at their outcomes, they were almost identical uh, to the findings from the, the study from Ontario. Uh, there was no difference in a local regional recurrence between, you know, the, the hypofractionation arms that they were looking at um, and the, the standard at the time. And that's what's shown here in these two uh, Kaplan-Meier curves here. Um, the red is, you know, the, the standard, uh, which was the 50 gray, and then the blue um, was the 39. So the top one here, this is start A and the bottom one is start B. Uh, start B was just uh, 40 grain, 15 fractions. And, you know, I highlighted the p-values here. You can see that it looks like these curves are separating, uh, but um, this the difference was not statistically significant. And again, this was a very large non-inferiority trial, thousands of patients included, um, and there was no difference. Even when they did a subgroup analysis by the vari variables that we've talked about before, um, and this was published in the Lancet again, you know, kind of corroborating uh, what was becoming more mainstream at the time. Um, so a lot of centers, you know, at this point were, were starting to adopt hypofractionation and it was sort of mainstream, honestly, at this point. Um, and then, um, so this is the original FAST trial and I highlighted here just, you know, because it gets confusing with the naming. Um, this was the FAST trial from 2011, the one that was delivering hypofractionation once a week um, for five weeks. And uh, they were comparing this one to the 50 gray. And this was the original study. Their main, the primary endpoint in this study um, was just looking at the normal tissue, you know, toxicity. And then they looked at cancer control outcomes and secondary endpoints. So when you look at their primary outcome, um, and they also published their long-term follow-up results in 2020, again, at the peak of the pandemic, they, they published their 10-year follow-up results, which I'm showing here in the, in the top left corner. And again, you can see that, you know, um, in terms of, you know, toxicity amongst the different arms, um, there was no difference between, you know, the, the 28.5, and the 50 in 25. Uh, there was a slightly increased grade three uh, toxicity, skin toxicity level with the group that got um, the six gray times five. So that's this arm here. And that difference was actually statistically significant. You can see that from the P value. So these were their results at five years. And then with the updated results from you know 2020, you can see as well that the, the 30 gray appears to be slightly toxic, you know, close to 5% of the patients having grade three or greater skin toxicity uh, compared to, you know, less than 1% with the 50 gray and just over 1% one, uh, with the 28.5. So, you know, the way I interpret this when I, in my practice, if I'm going to do the once a week regimen, 
uh, for that reason, I tend to, to lean uh, towards doing the 28.5 uh, purely for that reason. Uh, but in terms of, you know, when, when you look at the secondary endpoints, which were the cancer control outcomes that are shown here, um, there was really no difference. You know, there was, these numbers were very low number of events. I mean, this is after 10 years, we're looking at less than 2%, you know, any, any breast cancer event, you know, whether it's local or regional. Um, so really, again, showing that, you know, hypofractionation works is non-inferior. Um, and um, so, and then the, the Kaplan-Meier curve is just looking at the, the cosmesis. Uh, and you can see that here, the, the teal color here, the bottom color, you can see, so on the y-axis, it's, you know, the percentage of patients uh, who have, who did not have any, any grade three toxicity. So you can see that, you know, the number is slightly lower for patients who got the 30 grade. And then there's really no difference between the 28.5 versus the 50 uh, here. So again, you know, kind of showing the importance of, you know, the assumptions you make with the alpha beta ratio. And then lastly, um, you know, this is the fast forward uh, trial, which was first reported um, again in 2020. Uh, this trial is a little bit different from the other three in that the, the follow-up is a little bit short. Um, the median follow-up is about 5.9 years, whereas the other ones have more than 10 years of follow-up. But regardless, I mean, this was um, a big game changer and, and certainly helpful in the pandemic. Um, so the fast forward trial, you know, you can see that their control arm, which is the standard by this time, you know, the, the 40 and 15 had become standard. So that was the standard arm. So the experimental arm um, was just, you know, 5.2 or 5.4 gray per fraction times five. And all of this was done in one week and the patients are done. Um, and they included patients of all ages, you know, which is, um, kind of interesting. Uh, the other trials um, had included patients who were slightly older, older than 50, but fast forward actually included patients who were, you know, minimum age 18. Um, and interestingly, they, they actually uh, made an addendum to their protocol, you know, back in 2013 to actually exclude patients with extremely low risk of breast cancer. Uh, you know, patients who were over 65 had grade one cancers, uh, you know, patients that we consider as candidates for eliminating radiation, they were not included in this trial when they amended it because they actually wanted to have enough number of events to, to demonstrate a difference across the three arms. And you can see um, the overall number of events was very low. So with, you know, close to six years of follow-up, um, you know, just 2.3% in the 40 and 15, 40 and 15 um, arm having a recurrence or any sort of event. Um, and then when you compare, you know, the 27 and the 26, um, not a big difference. Um, there was, however, um, a difference in terms of toxicity. So on the bottom right here, these are their results when you look at the, the cosmetic outcomes uh, for the patients. So the, you know, the control arm is um, the 14, 15. So that's the baseline. Um, and then here they're showing the odds ratio, uh, you know, using the control arm is the baseline. And you can see, you know, when you compare the 27 to the 26, um, looks like my arrows actually got shifted. They're supposed to be pointing to um, the 27 gray here, but you can see the hazard ratio here you know, 1.5, so definitely increased toxicity, you know, um, in comparison to the baseline. Uh, this is for breast distortion, uh, and they actually took pictures. This is well documented. It's, it's very objective, and, and it's done by the clinician. Um, same thing when you look at breast shrinkage, they did see a much higher risk of breast shrinkage with 27. Um, in theory, it doesn't sound like a big difference, but it actually makes on a radiobiological standpoint, it makes a big difference, which is why as clinicians, I think we need to pay attention to these things. Um, and same thing, you know, when they looked at breast induration, um, 
almost a 50% increased uh, risk of having induration with the 27. But the, the 26 grade, which is the 5.2, actually did really well. And these differences were obviously statistically significant. You can see that uh, from the p-values. So, you know, in my practice, when I am using fast forward, uh, my go-to regimen, you know, based on this data, I, I do the, the 26 grade, the 5.2, if I'm doing fast forward, again, because of, of this data. Uh, but otherwise, you know, I counsel the patients, you know, that we're obviously waiting for more mature data. The, the follow-up is a little bit shorter than what we typically aim for. Um, but then, you know, there are some patients where, you know, this is, this is so convenient and, and I know even from the, the time that I've spent in, in Zimbabwe, in my home country, you know, this is a very good choice, you know, for patients when you have uh, resources that are limited. Um, so we're almost out of time here. So I would say these are, this is what I would consider, you know, the, the summary on hypofractionation for early stage breast cancer. Uh, all of the data that I've shown um, demonstrates that hypofractionation is not only safe in terms of cosmesis, but it's actually effective in treating the breast cancer itself. And this is something that I think should be widely adopted and something that's useful, um, you know, both in high income countries or low middle to middle income countries. Um, the data that I've shown, you know, and I hope I've convinced you that, you know, the data shows that this is not inferior to conventional fractionation. We're not short selling patients. We're not doing anything wrong with anything, maybe a slight, slightly improved um, cosmetic outcomes. Um, and then when it comes to ultra hypofractionation or extreme hypofractionation, um, you know, again, I, I put this, you know, appears to be non-inferior. Again, I, I would like to see more longer follow-up with the fast forward data being um, replicated to by multiple centers. Um, so, and then I just put a little note here. Um, it's always important, I think, when we're seeing patients in clinic to know if the patients we're treating would have been eligible for the trials, um, you know, that we're, we're extrapolating our practice from. Um, so again, you know, I think with the ultra hypofractionation, I think I'm much more comfortable with the FAST, the original FAST, just because of the longer term data, but um, more and more, I think even in our clinic, we're starting to, to do the fast forward even more frequently. Um, and then, you know, when you look at the toxicity, um, there were really no differences, you know, in cardiac toxicity in the fast, the fast forward, and then even in the start trials. But again, the goal in treating, you know, breast cancer patients with radiotherapy, you know, we always want to pay attention to, you know, cardiac dose, you know, lung dose as well as, you know, um, and I know many of you guys that I've spoken with are doing hypofractionation for, um, you know, regional nodal irradiation or the post mastectomy setting. So again, paying attention to, you know, your hot spots, you know, to minimize long-term toxicity such as breakup of Um So in, you know, this is not meant to be a rubric, but this is just, you know, my perspective, my take, I would say at this time, um, when I think about, you know, all the different fractionation schemes that are there, um, these are sort of, you know, my go-to. I consider the 1525 to be, you know, more historic, you know, at this point. And the standard really is the, you know, the, the three-week uh, hypofractionation. And then, but I think with all this data that we've gotten in the last two years from fast and fast forward and a lot of centers here, publishing their results and there are a lot of ongoing studies um i i really do believe that you know the the five fraction will be you know the standard in the near future i, I really consider that um so today i'm only focusing on a small portion of you know uh, breast cancer therapy i did not talk about a lot of other things that would have applied to those cases that we presented on um, i didn't talk about you know partial breast irradiation we didn't talk about, you know, omission of radiation in very low risk patients who are otherwise going to take endocrine therapy. We didn't talk about boost and then, of course, DCIS. So just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, 
And then, as I mentioned, you know, my focus today is just on early stage. Um, I do have a slide that just kind of talks about PMRT in brief, but I think we have more data for early stage and more and more data is, is coming up. And there are a lot of large trials that we're waiting for now that have finished accruing uh, for PMRT. So before I go to the next slide, it looks like there's a question here. Um, so this is a question from Dr. Asif Nisar. And the question is, would you recommend avoiding ultra hypofractionation when regional nodal irradiation is indicated? Um, so that's a really good question. Um, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, I think here in Boston, for example, we don't have a shortage of resources. You know, we can afford to be very picky or very snobby and say, you know, we don't have the strong data. We're going to wait until we get, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, so recognizing that maybe right now we're in a privileged position, you know, in my practice, I am not doing any ultra hypofractionation when, when I'm doing PMRT or treating the regional nodes. In fact, I'll show you some data in a second from a French study that was just published in the Red Journal um, two months ago that actually shows, you know, maybe that it's not safe. But again, you know, I think we just want to get more data. So I think if you have the option, um, I would try to avoid doing ultra hypofractionation. I think, you know, for, for the three week course, the moderate hypofractionation, it makes sense. But I think I would be more careful because even though the fast forward trial did include patients who had a mastectomy, the numbers were very small. Um, so I would like to see a, a, a large study dedicated to, to that um, before adopting it sort of like as mainstream. Um, so, okay, so we covered all of this. Uh, so maybe let's just go over those two cases again, um, and you can post your answers in the, in the chat. Uh, based on what we talked about, and I'm going to wrap up maybe in another five minutes or so. So just to recap, our first case was a 43-year-old woman um, who had a T1CN0 um, invasive ductal cancer. It's grade three. And of these options, you know, based on what we talked about or based on your own experiences, what would most people, you know, recommend for this patient? Yeah, so C with the boost. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, looks like C. A couple people will do D. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it looks like, you know, a lot of Cs, um, you know, a lot of Bs and Cs. Um, some people are not doing a boost for this patient. Um, yeah, the good thing is, you know, no one is picking F, you know, which, which is great. Um, I think that's really great. Um, let's see here. Okay. No, thank you. That's great. I, I think uh, you can keep the answers coming in, but it's, it's clear that most people would do, you know, a lot of people will do C, um, and then some people are also doing D. So, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. Like, there's no one correct answer here. Um, I think for this patient, you would have to have a strong reason to do option A in this day and age, because with the data that we've shown, um, it's pretty clear that you know, moderate hypofractionation is non-inferior. So you would have to make a good argument to treat this patient you know, for five or six weeks. Um, so I think if you're going to do moderate hypofractionation, um, B or C are correct, but I think, you know, this is grade three. It's a young patient. Um, I think a boost is, should be included. This patient does need a boost. Um, yes, somebody posted here. I like that, you know, they said all of these are evidence-based, but I think we, as clinicians, you know, we should um, risk stratify our patients. So for example, you know, F is evidence-based, but, you know, the ASTRO guidelines do not recommend APBI for women over 50. Um, so for a young patient like this to do partial breast, breast irradiation, you might be short selling them. And obviously, you know, 
F includes uh, no radiation, this patient would not have been eligible for the trials that you know, looked at omitting radiotherapy. Those trials were done you know, in patients over 65, in patients over 70, and then we have other studies that are looking at patients over 50. But for a young patient like this, I would you know, strongly recommend radiation. I think boost is standard. This is grade three disease. And then, you know, somebody posted, you know, more toxicity, um, not sure what the comment was on. Um, so yes, I agree. This patient needs a boost. So, and then between G and E, um, in my practice, again, you know, the, the fast forward study included patients who were over 18. So this patient <clears throat> would have been treated on the fast forward protocol. And I think it's appropriate, especially if you're uh, in that setting. Um, so there's a question here, it says, what are the factors in favor of boost apart from age? Um, I think because it's grade three disease, um, those are the main things that would uh, push me to do boost. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so I was saying options D and E are perfectly acceptable. Uh, this patient would have been included on fast and fast forward. Um, but again, you know, there were small numbers of younger patients. And um, in my case, I'd like to see more, more data. Um, somebody said, why not A? No, A is perfectly fine. Um, a is, is, a, is, you know, that's what we were doing. I consider that to be historic, it's, it's standard. Um, but, you know, you have to ask yourself, you know, why are you, is there any reason why you have to have this patient come in for, you know, five or six weeks when they can get equivalent outcomes, equivalent cosmetic outcomes and cancer control outcomes uh, with just three weeks, um, especially when, when you're trying to treat more patients on the machine. So, um, all right. Uh, those are all great questions. I, I, I really love this audience. You guys are very engaged. Um, I really appreciate it. But I think in the interest of time, maybe I'll move to the, um, the next case. So um, yeah, so I, I would exclude option F for this patient. So the next case, this was now a very uh, elderly patient. Um, and with very low risk, I would consider this very low risk, uh, you know, uh, breast cancer. Are there any people, I mean, what do people think, you know, how, how are you treating these patients in your clinical practice, I guess? So DOE, That's interesting, yeah. I think I'm seeing more, um, more people, um, you know, opting for not doing radiation, no boost. I like that. Uh huh. Yeah. So no, that's that's great. I think um, those are all great answers. So again, like I say, there's no right or wrong answer here. Um, but this patient is very low risk. Um, and for me, when I meet this patient, I present all options to them. Um, I, I counsel them on all the treatment options, including. Uh, omission of radiation. Uh, we, we, we have, you know, good data now that shows that the risk of recurrence, you know, without radiation is um, very small. As long as they take their endocrine therapy, it's about 2% versus 10% um, based on the data that we have in all the omission trials. So I always kind of make sure that the patient understands that if they're opting to not do radiation. Um, because it, you know, it's for some people, you know, 2% versus, you know, 10%. Uh, and that data comes from, I'm quoting the data from the PRIME2 study. Um, I just want to make sure that the patient understands that. Um, but it's perfectly reasonable to not do radiation for this patient. This is also a good patient to do, if you're going to do partial breast irradiation, let's say they, um, you know, they, they, they don't want to omit radiation, they want to do something, this is a good candidate. Um, for, for partial breast irradiation. And then in my practice, these are the patients I'm pushing for the, for the fast and fast forward um, because they're just so low risk, you know, um, and more and more, you know, these are the kind of patients that I'm selecting for this, unless if they are very large breasted and I'm worried about hotspots. Um, 
but um, these are really good good thoughts. Yeah, it looks like a lot of people would consider no radiation for this patient, which is fine. Um, and I wouldn't do a boost for this patient. Um, you know, she's you know over over sixty. Um, it's grade one, uh, and the boost trials, you know, which I didn't discuss today, showed that the benefit is greatest in the younger patients. So. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't boost this patient, but it's not wrong. Okay. Um, this slide, I just put it here for reference uh, because I think the organizers wanted me to include something on, on metrics. Um, these are variable, but this is what I'm using in my clinic, in my practice. So it will be in the, um, uh, the slides when you get them. And I know Jackie's going to go over the technical aspects. So I won't even spend too much time on this. Um, and then in the remaining um, maybe three minutes, we can just talk about PMRT because last time when I did this talk, I had said, you know, we wouldn't do hypofractionation um, for PMRT. But then I realized that a lot of my colleagues from around the world, this is pretty standard. And a lot of people have published, you know, their outcomes with good results. And um, so I just wanted to maybe spend you know, just two minutes just talking about this. Um, so obviously in patients with, you know, high risk breast cancer who are getting a mastectomy and coming to us for post mastectomy radiation, the data, you know, we don't have very large trials like we do have for early stage breast cancer. Um, so fewer people use this, at least at my institution and, you know, most places in the US, the main concerns are a lot of times when you're doing uh, PMRT, a lot of the patients, you know, end up getting regional node irradiation, and then you worry about toxicity. Um, and then, you know, many of the times, too, if the patients have had reconstruction, there's concern about, um, you know, the impact on, on their implant as well. Um, so the last time I gave this talk, you know, this study from China hadn't been published, um, but, you know, we actually now have very good level one evidence, um, prospective data from China. Um, this was published in the Lancet, uh, where they had women who had undergone uh, mastectomy. A lot of the patients had T3 or T4 disease. Uh, they were randomized to um, the you know, standard fractionation, and then they used a slightly different uh, moderate hyperfractionation regimen here. They did 43.5 and 15 fractions. Um, and, you know, in this study, they didn't have a lot of um, differences, actually, in, in toxicity or, or outcomes. Uh, they had very good results when they looked, they, when they published this, the median follow-up was about five years. Um, and there was no difference in the local regional recurrence risk. It was about 8% in either arm. Um, so this is, this is, you know, really good data. Um, the, the main caveat is, you know, obviously in this trial, the patients did not have any reconstruction. A lot of the patients that we see in our clinic have had reconstruction or undergo reconstruction. They also did 2D treatment in this study. Um, so, you know, just, but this is really good data. It's promising. It shows that it's feasible. Um, and it's always good to have, you know, large trials with, you know, that are randomized. And then there's a study from France that was just published. But I think I mentioned this briefly. Uh, I'll show you a slide in a second. And then we've had two very large trials that were accruing here. Uh, the Fabric trial was actually uh, the, the principal investigator, you know, uh, is actually here at, at Brigham. Um, but the study was being done at several institutions. Uh, and then we have the Alliance trial. Both of these studies have actually finished accruing, so it'll be really good to see uh, the final results. Uh, it will probably take a couple years for us to get events, to get results, but the difference between these two US studies and the, the study from China is these studies actually had patients with, um, with uh, reconstruction. So it would be good to look at those outcomes in the long term. Um, so, you know, this is just the data from um, China, uh, from Peking University. Um, and you can see the only difference that they show, which was interesting, was that they had more grade three toxicity in the conventional fractionation arm. And I think part of it is, you know, when you do hypofractionation, 
a lot of the toxicity actually happens after the patient has complete, uh, completed their treatment. So I've wondered if maybe it's just a matter of timing. If many of those patients are not seen within three weeks after finishing radiation, I wonder if maybe part of it was missed. But otherwise, when you look across the board here, there are really no differences. Even uh, for these patients, you know, when you look at their cardiac toxicity or lung toxicity, no differences. Um, so um, let's see. So somebody is posting in the chart. They want me to go back to the the tolerance slide. So I will share these slides with you. I know Jackie has to go in, in two minutes. So I will email these slides. You have them and you can take a look at that. And, you know, I can feel free to email me if there are any questions. But um, in the interest of time, we do have to move forward. So um, and then the last thing that I'll mention is this study uh, was just published in the, the Red Journal. It's a single institution, you know, retrospective study from uh, St. Louis Hospital in France, uh, where they looked at their data for patients that they treated with, um, uh, this is actually, I don't know, I, I would put this in the, I wouldn't consider this moderate hypofractionation because they actually did this in six fractions. Uh, but it's, it's a sort of a weird regimen where the patients got four fractions or four gray on random days, and then there was a break. It's not something that we would do, but the, the one thing I wanted to highlight uh, from this study, you know, and 84% of their patients had written a rich, you know, not radiation. I just wanted to highlight, you know, across their patients when they looked at these, you know, 450 patients, the, the cumulative um, local recurrence risk, uh, local regional recurrence risk was about 15%, which is on the higher end. And then they looked at, you know, fact, factors that predicted um, for increased local recurrence risk and um, patients who had, you know, axillary lymph node involvement had a much higher, you know, hazard ratio, three times higher. I mean, this is incredibly high. And I just wanted to highlight this, you know, again, you know, for us clinicians, when you're seeing patients, I think it's important to know, you know, I would be very cautious to offer a patient with positive nodes to offer them this option. So, um, you know, this is retrospective. It's not randomized in any way. And I think we'll just wait for the data from Fabric and the Alliance trial. But I just wanted to highlight that. So we are right at uh, 10 uh, and I'm going to stop. Um, if there are any questions, um, a creditor, do we have any time for questions or should we uh, maybe have Jackie present and then we can do questions at the end? Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, we probably could have Jackie present and then afterwards we could entertain more questions. Okay, sounds good. So, all right, thanks everybody. I'm going to stop sharing and then uh, let's see what uh, Jackie is going to present. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I will go ahead and introduce um, our next speaker, Jackie Noamanda. Uh, she is the program director of uh, medical dosimetry at Suffolk University. She has a, where she had a master's of science in medical dosimetry, and she also worked at the Massachusetts General Hospital as a dosimetrist. Uh, she holds a bachelor of arts, I'm sorry, yeah, a bachelor of arts in physics from Smith College, um, and a medical, a, a master's in science degree in medical dosimetry from Southern Illinois University uh, at Camondale, as well as a certificate of advanced graduate study in health professional education from Simeon University, uh, where she's currently a doctoral student. She has been certified medical dosimetrist she, since 2004 and has held various positions in the clinical setting, academia, and in the industry. Um, as a side note, as a side note, she has a passion in teaching and mentoring students. And in her spare time, she enjoys cooking, reading, running, spending time with friends. So please welcome Jackie Noamanda with us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. And uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, let me share my screen. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can say. Okay. Um, so thank you so much again for that introduction. Uh, one thing that I didn't put in the intro is that I'm uh, I'm originally from Kenya. So although I've been here oh. since 1995, uh, I'm Kenyan. 
And um, okay, so I'm going to talk about, uh, so this lecture I modified from one that I, I give to my students. And so I just modified it to, you know, talk more about um, hyperfractionation and some of the uh, extra considerations we take there. Now, a lot of what I'm going to be uh, talking about is not very different than what you would do for uh, non-hyperfractionated breast planning, right? So there's going to be just some general information. And so if any of it is too basic, I apologize, uh, but I want this to be, I really like that it was very interactive when Dr. Chiviza was presenting. And so I'll be throwing out some prompts um, just to see uh, what people are thinking. So this is the outline I'm going to go over to set up and immobilization. I'll talk about planning with a focus on field and field. I will also mention wedges because those haven't really gone away forever. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about plan evaluation, uh, which in my experience with hyperfractionation, it's really more about the hotspots. Uh, that's the, one of the main things that I feel is different than when we're doing uh, conventional planning. And then I'll a little bit about IGRT and then just some general uh, quality issues. So for CT uh, SIM for immobilization, uh, as you as most of you are probably doing, we use a, a breast board. Uh, so this is an example uh, with a, it has different parts to it. Uh, there's different armrests there for reprodu reproducibility and comfort. There's a headrest. Uh, one thing that's very important, obviously, is we elevate the patient, the torso is elevated so that the sternum is parallel to the floor. And I'll show that in, a, in an image uh, on the next slide. Uh, we also have uh, what we very technically call a butt stop to prevent the patient from sliding down. Um, and the reason we elevate the patient is to help the breast tissue to fall inferiorly and to avoid folding um, in the superclub area and for the breast to fall back towards the, the neck. So this is that uh, just a side, a sagittal view to show the sternal angle. So there is a sternal angle, there's the couch. And so because the patient has been uh, raised up this way, this ends up being parallel to the floor. This helps in planning because then you end up needing less collimation in order to align uh, your central axis with um, the chest wall. So that's one of the big advantages in having uh, the patient elevated as well. Uh, so this is an example of the, the exact board that we use at MGH. Uh, so we use a Civco board, and that's what it looks like with the different armrests, the loose side head, head cup. Uh, we also use a knee bolster uh, just to help with lumbar comfort for the patients because they're going to be sitting on the table, uh, lying on the table for quite a while. And then here's that um, uh, butt stop that I talked about. And this is just another view uh, for the RTs. What's really nice with this board is there's different indexing that can be done, um, and, you know, for all the different parts of the board. So they know exactly, you know, for each patient, what's the height of this uh, armrest, which angle is it turned towards? And so that way they can customize the setting uh, for each patient. So it's exactly um, reproducible um, every day. So this is just one example. I'm sure there's uh, different ones that, that folks are using out there. So our goals are for the patient to be comfortable and relaxed, that the position is reproducible. Uh, we want to sim them so that the spine is straight and centered on the breastboard. And we want the breast tissue to fall inferiorly rather than superior. So especially for the larger breasted patients, if they're not angled up properly, you do see that the breast falls back and actually have an example to show that falls backwards up towards the chin area. And then you can run into problems um, later on. So we want to adjust the breastboard angle as needed. Uh, what I've seen is sometimes for some, and I, I'm curious if people can just type in the chat, if, uh, you know, for some centers, it's just a standard angle that everybody uses, like, I don't know, five degrees or 10 degrees, um, and other places, they want to customize it um, for every patient. So I'm curious to see what uh, folks are doing, whether it's one angle or if you're customizing it um, across the board. And I don't think I can see things in the chat as I'm, I just see Q&A, or oh, I, see, I see some chat now. Okay, someone said they're customizing it, so that's good to hear. Okay. Uh, but I also see the benefit in having a standard, right? So that way it makes it easier to, um, to get the patients through and not have to keep adjusting. So pros and cons for everything, as we know. All right. And then, uh, so for, for CT SIM, there's, I'm sure people are marking and uh, marking patients very differently. Before I talk about the tattoos, one thing that I do want to mention is that MGH, we've actually gone away from, we don't do tattoos anymore. We're only using Vision RT, which is the optical surface imaging. But I have included, um, you know, this, I think we've been doing this for about a year and a half or so, but I did include images from what we did historically. So for all of our supine patients, unless 
unless there's some really odd reason that we need to, we're not tattooing the patients, but this is how we did it historically. So there would be an APBB uh, sort of in line with the nipple, and then there'll be one inferior levelar to, make, to help us with this treatment this way. And then laterally, um, so we have a lateral BB here that's in line with this one. And then here's a lateral leveler that's going to be in line with this one. And this is the patient that I can, I'm showing you as an example, she should have been put, uh, the breastboard angle should have been brought up more because you can see the breast is actually falling backwards. We're having folds um, in the axillary area. So this is one that we would have, uh, if I was at the same, I think I would have asked them to, to increase the angle. Then there's some wires here. There's an inferior wire to just sort of demarcate for us where the inferior border is going to be. And then her scar has also been wired. So that's just one example of, of what we're doing. The next, uh, what I'm going to show next is just so within our institution, because as you know, and throughout this talk, uh, I'm going to emphasize, you know, as planners, we're treating the patients, but we also treat the physician, right? Because all the physicians plan differently. We have to learn what they like and customize everything uh, based on what they're doing. So here's an example of different wiring. So this is within our institution, but different physicians. So one physician only marks the lateral breast tissue. And, um, and then also the inframammary fold and the scar. Uh, Dr. B wires the entire breast and the scar. And Dr. C does the entire breast and leaves a little gap here and the scar, as well as puts a BB on the nipple to help um, with the contouring later on. So again, within one institution, we're seeing a lot of different things being done. And so that's just to, as an example that there's gonna be variations depending on where you are. Um, seeing a question in the chat, I think. Could sim in prone position be more suitable for this patient? Potentially, yes, I will get to that. That would have been, a, I think she wasn't very mobile. It was hard for her to get into the prone, but that would have been good uh, based on her size. That's a good question. Thank you. All right. So we also do deep inspiration breath hold for uh, left-sided patients. Um, so as we know, if they take a deep breath, then there's some separation between the chest wall and the heart, and that buys us some room here. So that is something that we, I would say it's now standard for us to do uh, breath hold, as long as the patient can tolerate it. And as long as it did buy us something, there's some patients you scan and no matter how deep a breath they take, you barely gain anything. And so for those case, uh, case, it's very rare, but occasionally we do have a free breathing um, left-sided case. So when we're simming for, um, for the breath hold, so this is how our therapists are coaching the patients. Uh, they have to be coached before the start of the scan. They are asked to uh, breathe using their chest instead of the diaphragm. Um, and our threshold is that they must be able to hold their breath for at least 15 to 20 seconds per field. And we only scan after we've confirmed that the patient can take constant breaths throughout. And we take two scans. We take a free breathing scan, and then we take a breath hold. And it is the physician who decides which scan to use. So that's the uh, physician um, deciding which, which, whether they're going to do breath hold, if they're going to do free breathing. But I would say 99% of the time, we end up doing um, breath hold. And I'm seeing questions or just comments. Okay. So... That's that. And then now for the scanning piece, uh, the therapist will uh, take scouts to confirm that the patient is straight and that the entire breast is in the field of view. We scan from the tragus down through L1. Uh, we do 2.5 millimeter slices uh, standard, and the scan time is about 17 to 20 seconds, so it's pretty quick. Um, if we're doing breath hold, we take the uh, deep inspiration breath hold scan immediately after the free breathing scan. Uh, contouring, I think for this audience, uh, as far as I can tell, I think majority of the audience is physicians. So I will, you know, just put in that outline there. We do uh, follow uh, RTUG breast atlas for contouring. So here's an example where we've got the, um, the breast tissue, the lumpectomy. Luckily for this patient, there's also some clips uh, to show us where things were and then the heart. I will mention here um, that some of our physicians are contouring out the left anterior descending artery and tracking the dose. But as far as I have seen, I haven't seen a, a dose limit that they're posting to it. And Fallon, maybe you can speak to that uh, if there's a question about it, but I have seen that in the practice. And actually, Fallon, I'm going to ask you to, can you comment on that? I'm sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> okay. Um, so when I was training, I rotated at MGH. Um, from my understanding, uh, they were doing it mostly for research purposes. There's not okay. a lot of data on it. 
Um, yeah. So it's tracking and, you know, just to see maybe down the road if, if, it, if it matters. Right. And okay. I don't, I, we don't use it at the Brigham. We, we don't counter it at all. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. So that's been uh, the experience as well. Uh, someone said, what is approximate percent dose error if patients treated with free breathing compared to deep breath hold? Percent error. Um, so if they're treating free breathing, but you planned, I'm not sure I follow the question. Is that the mistake was made? So I will come back to that. I'm going to come back and check on that. I'm not sure I understand the question right this second, but I will come back to it. Okay. So uh, setting up of the fields, uh, uh, we do want to cover the whole breast tissue, but minimize the lung dose. We want a non-divergent posterior edge. Uh, to the extent possible, we want to avoid entry or exit to the contralateral breast. There are some exceptions if the patient's cavity is right here. If it's very, very medial, then you may end up having to creep over into the contralateral breast in order to cover the cavity. We typically want two to three cm of flash uh, because we want to account for, if, uh, especially for free breathing, we want to make sure that they don't breathe out of the field. And then also to account for swelling. Some of these patients swell during treatment and then the field border ends up being very close to the breast tissue. So we just give extra flash. Um, I tell my students that uh, flash is free. That's the only thing that's free in, in dosimetry is flash. So here's an example of a beam's eye view of the portal. Uh, we do rotate the collimator so that um, this posterior edge is parallel to the chest wall. And this is where when if you have your breastboard angled properly, then you don't need too much collimation. Uh, if your angle, if your breastboard angle is not high enough, then you have to do a lot of collimation. And I'll show an example where sometimes then you get into trouble where this corner of the, the superior part of the tangent field is touching the arm or getting into the arm. So I'll show that as well. But general guidelines are one to two cm above and below the breast tissue. Typically, uh, we don't want the humeral head in the field. There have been some cases where uh, we've seen that, especially when you're doing high tangents, if for whatever reason you needed to, uh, maybe maybe the patient has, I think, sentinel lymph node micromastastasis. Sometimes I've seen where we do high tangents on those patients. So you might see us creeping up into the humeral head. Standard is 2 cm of lung bite. Um, lateral border is usually mid axillary line, but we're typically following what the breast contour looks like. And then we do block the heart. So the heart for us is never exposed uh, directly to the primary beam, to the open beam. We do uh, block the heart and we use a mean dose limit of one gray um, at MGH for all, for all, uh, all the patients. Uh, some uh, physicians will also block the liver for right-sided patients. So I've seen that done as well, where they'll block the liver. Okay. Um, Show us the slides before none exit on contralateral breast. I think somebody wants me to go back. Um, is it this? I'm not sure what the... Well, hopefully that was okay. All right, I'll continue. All right, so here was an example of high tangents. Uh, yeah, so the, here the superior border has been um, extended to cover without adding a superclav field. So this is um, an example of where you might see high tangents and there's the humeral head. Um, all right, so let's talk about energy and I'm going to be asking the audience for some questions here. So typically we're going with 6MV uh, because you want, this gives you the best superficial coverage because as we know, our target is coming basically all the way into the, into the skin. And then also depending on where the cavity is, if the seroma is very shallow, then you definitely want 6MV. Um, Higher energy, um, for, for, for larger patients, we do use a higher energy, for example, 10 MV, or a mix of 6 and 10 MV, or 6 and 15, depending on what um, people have in the, in the, in the clinic. The our cutoff, our general, what, what I typically look for is once, once the bridge separation, so I measure, I take a measurement here, and if that starts to exceed 20 cm, then I'm already starting to think about using uh, some mix of higher energy. And I'm curious to know what the audience does. What, what are your preferences in terms of energy? What I've seen, um, just it's just an observation. This is not, you know, just my own observation of, I feel like physicians are more willing now to go to a higher energy, especially when we're doing the ultra hypofractionation, because we do want to limit those hotspots. So, um, so let's see, 6MV, people said, uh, someone asked mean dose one gray according to which protocol. Um, I think that was a paper from Whelan. Um, it was a retrospective study. And I think that's where the one gray number comes from. Um, uh, Fallon, you can correct me, but that's that's my understanding. Is that correct? Correct, yeah, that's yeah. correct. 
right? So a lot of people are using six and 10, some are mixing. So that's that's case if you're discussing only chest wall without axial nodes. Yes, exactly, right, good. Okay, very well. So again, this is another place where we, we're treating the physician. We treat the patient and we treat the physician. We know what they like and we present um, what we think that they would approve. So this is just to show the effect of energy. So here's six MV. The, the whole, you know, you can see the superficial coverage is really good. Um, here's 10 MV, and then here's 15 MV. So you can see that this starts to creep in. The sort of green line there is the 95% line. So you still get some good coverage, but then you, you, you're you obviously a little bit cold in terms of what's um, where the full coverage is, is being received. Okay, so let's talk about, so we put our beams on, and now uh, when we first... Um, calculate the doses just with two opposed beams, we're obviously going to have a big hotspot here because this is where the, the beam sees the least tissue, right? This is the thinnest part. And so we're gonna have this big hotspot here uh, because of the shape of the breast. So this is 115% of the prescription dose. So I'm gonna start off with wedges. We would put wedges um, to uh, push that dose down and make it more homogeneous. So you're preferentially filtering uh, from the thicker end down to the thinner end. I will mention that some clinics will avoid uh, a wedge in the medial side, on the medial tangent, because you want to reduce catheters to the contralateral breast, especially if they're a younger patient. Um, and actually, let me just hide my controls here for a second. Um, I'll hide video panel. Okay, that's good. Um, all right, so we've we've put wedges, and that's the um, that's the result that we got. So I went from 115, my hotspots went down to 107%. Now, for most, most physicians that, that I've planned for, uh, what they consider an ideal plan is with the hotspots are balanced in the corners and at the apex. But um, I know like at the Brigham, for example, they, they try to avoid having this hotspot at the apex. We certainly try and avoid having it near the nipple uh, because of, it's very sensitive in that area. So this is just one example. So the 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 pink one is 107. The yellow is 105%. Um, and so that's that's an example of something that would be treated. Now that is with wedges. So just let's just remember that I ended up at 107% in this case. Um, now we go to field and field planning. So again, we've started off with 115%. So now I've taken out the wedges and I'm just going to plan this with field and field. So we started off with 115% and now we're gonna create subfields to block the hotspots incrementally. So what I'll do is we turn on the 115% line in one of the fields. So in this example, they did the medial. Um, I copy it and then I block uh, that 115 with MLCs. And then I subtract uh, dose out of the open field from the parent field. Uh, and give that to the subfield until that hotspot disappears. So here I started off with 135 and 130, so medial and lateral. I did the what one subfield, subtracted seven, I put seven, seven centigrade into that first subfield and reduced my original field to 128. So once you add these two up, it adds up to that. And so with in doing that, that 115% hotspot is gone. And that's what I end up with. And then I go to the next one. So I go down to 112% and I'm going to block that in the lateral field. So again, I've copied it into a subfield, block the 112%. Um, we try to watch when we're getting close to the cavity that we don't end up not over blocking. And I'll show an example of over blocking. So now the 112% is gone. And then I'll probably chase and go down to say 109, et cetera. So we keep adding subfields until the overall hotspot is down to your clinic's um, specification, whatever that may be. Could be 105, 107. If they're very large, I've seen some 110 uh, being accepted, but that's not very common anymore with field and field. So in the end, this is what I, this was my final plan. Um, I ended up with 105% scattered like that. Is a very, very small 107. So you can see the distribution is actually much nicer than what I had with wedges. So this is standard now for us. We're doing field and field for all our, our patients. One difference is, so for MGH, this is delivered as six separate fields. This is just a technical note. Uh, the Brigham, uh, they merge the subfields into the parent field. So when they're treating over there, you have just two fields, your medial and your lateral, and then the subfields are sort of delivered like IMRT. Um, at MGH for different reasons, and I think Susie is on the call, maybe she can tell us why later, but we're, we're delivering this at, at six separate fields. 
uh, which, you know, uh, so that's just a technical difference in how things are being delivered. And let me just pause for a second and look at, um, okay, there's just some comments on hybrid plan, field in field, high energy be introduced, 105, yes. Yes, that's a good point. Sometimes we can mix. Uh, even if I did 6MV on the parent field, I could do 10MV on the subfields. And that's the advantage of the, I think, of having the separate fields as well, because when you're doing the merged fields, you can't mix the energies within one, one portal. Uh, so that would be one advantage of treating um, separate fields. Okay, so that's field and field. So I wanted to talk about some of the hotspot limits. And I feel like this is where um, the biggest difference I see in planning when I compare conventional planning to hypofractionated. So Astro's guideline for the hotspot limit, uh, this was the 2008 guidelines, is to limit the breast tissue receiving greater than 105% of the prescription dose. So that uh, the way we, we interpret that is to basically the 105, if it's there, needs to be broken up and not a continuous um, confluent, you know, 105 covering the whole breast. For UK FAST, um, I got this is out of this paper. This is a QA analysis of, of centers that participate in the, in, in the protocol. Uh, the recommendation that came after they did the analysis was um, to have the max hotspot to be less than or equal to 107% of the prescription dose. And then in addition, less, less than 5% of breast uh, PTV is how they labeled it, less than 5% of breast PTV to receive 105% of the prescription dose. So this, I feel, gives us a little bit more to go on rather than just visually, you know, in this example here, uh, making sure that things are broken up. So for the UK FAST, that is actually a dose limit that we have to report uh, when we're presenting these uh, plans to the physician. Um, so someone said, how much can we accept at global max in CC? Good question. So when we're doing uh, the Canadian fractionation, we limit no more than one CC at 107% of the hotspot. Um, so that's the limit that we have for the Canadian fractionation. And then um, hopefully the, what I've put here helps answer that a little bit more. This is 5% uh, at 105. It's not CC, but it's another, um, another, um, another guideline. Somebody said in the transversal view, do you measure the 95% color wash distance in lung and limit it to 2 cm as an example? No, we do not. We are going by uh, what the D what the DVH statistics um, are telling us. So that's what we're doing. Okay, good questions and comments. Okay, so um, I put this up there as these are the the limits we're following for UK fast. Uh, at Master General, I, I, be, I, I believe that these are actually out of the protocol. Um, and Fallon can confirm for me the one, the mean dose of one gray. I don't know if that's part of the protocol, like that's something that we added, but these are out of the protocol. So there's two heart uh, limits here, and then there's an ipsilateral lung limit, 15 to 17%, 7.8. So for this one, when I'm planning for the physicians, I, I start with 15. I try and meet 15, and then if we absolutely cannot, then we uh, try and, and, and limit the to the 17. But for the most part, we're meeting this. It's very, I don't think I've ever gone over any of these limits. I mean, the heart, we're blocking. It's out of the field. We're doing breath hold. And then with this, we, you know, just with our field design, we're able to meet the, the limits. So let me see if there's more questions. What is the expected percent of lung toxicity when central lung dose? Okay, that I think is for Fallon. What is a protocol you follow for organ at risk constraint? This, I think, is from the trial itself right here. Um, this is from the trial. Okay. So I'm going to show you some examples of, um, like I said, we treat the patient. We also treat the physician. So here's an example of an approved plan for physician A. This was a Canadian fractionation. This is the 105 is the yellow. And then this is 107 here. And you can see that we covered... Um, the breast tissue really well. I think the question somebody was asking had to do with this. Uh, they were asking about the 95% going into the um, into the lung. So we, we're not measuring that. We're looking at this coverage. It's a good question, but I think um, the dose limits we're looking at are not in the high dose region. They're really on the low dose. So like the V15 to 17, uh, yeah, V the volume receiving, let me go back to the previous slide. Um, seven to eight gray, you know, out of the 2850 or whatever it is, is a lower on the lower end. So we're not really looking at this part. We're looking to make sure we have the coverage. 
I do recognize because I did when I worked in industry, I noticed that especially in Europe, in Europe or in other countries, I think the coverage, the way we look at coverage might be different. I think I feel like when I saw it, I think I think it was in Europe, but they would look at as long as the 95 percent cut line was covering, they were OK with it. So it looks like we are over treating, I think, is probably where that comment is coming from, because the prescription line, the 100 percent is actually covering the chest wall. So I'm gathering that's where that comment came came from. OK. All right. So that's uh, one physician. Here's another physician. Um, so this one, it is the 95 percent that's back there. The 100 percent line is covering and just uh, basically hugging the seroma. So that's considered, you know, still covering. But this is a different physician within the same practice, but different physicians with different um, expectations or different what they'll accept. Now, in this case, uh, this patient is also quite large. And so maybe that's why they were OK with uh, going a little bit colder. So I show this just, you know, coverage wise, it's a lot of it is physician dependent as well. And what, you know, some are more conservative than others, some are more aggressive. So those are some of the differences that I see. Okay. Um, okay. So let's keep going. There's a question about bolus. So we're, for these patients, we're not using bolus for intact breast um, unless there's unless it's a very high risk patient and the seroma is very superficial. But I rarely see bolus being used for outside of uh, post mastectomy um, irradiation. Okay. And let me just see if there's one more question. What other strategy do you employ to meet heart constraint aside from DIBH? Um, I will show that here in a, the, so I talked about blocking the heart. Uh, so actually blocking the heart with the MLCs and even blocking with margin. So I have a physician who says block, uh, exclude the heart from the field by five to seven millimeters. And so that does help. Um, it's a good question because the other thing we have to remember is most of the heart is going to be outside of the field and we're reporting this mean dose of one gray and um, maybe the maybe one of the physicists can comment on this but one of the uh, what I consider not a danger but the TPSs are not all that accurate as far as outside of field dose and so maybe that one gray could be a little bit higher I don't know it's a project that I'm hoping one of my students can work on and actually do some measurements but I just put that out there as things to think about um, Okay. Someone said ideally should look at metrics for ipsilateral lung. Yes, that is true. Are you reviewing the lung dose as a total, just the same color for both? So when we're all the dose limits that we have for breast patient, when we're doing breast is for ipsilateral lung. So we do show combined lung metrics, but we are evaluating all the metrics that we have in terms of DVH doses is for ipsilateral. And then someone said, yeah, to cover superior part of breast, the use of fluence plan instead of field lifting. Also, this reduced the max for tangents and high tangents. Yes, I agree. Uh, to what percent of underdose do you accept in breast tissue because of blocking heart? That's a great question, like we're doing here. Uh, that's a very good question. Depends on the physician. Um, I have physicians who will leave out anywhere from half CM to even maybe, in this example, you can see the cavities here they will cheat medially and even by half a cm to sometimes even a centimeter and just not cover the medial breast and just to cover that. Um, but I think that's based on their experience. Maybe they haven't had a lot of recurrence. And again, it's very physician dependent, whereas others would say, you know what, I'm going to accept slightly higher lung metrics. Uh, depends on the age of the patient. Obviously, if they're younger, then we're more likely to um, be more worried about heart. If you're a little bit older, maybe, you know, so it just depends on, on the situation. We we go by what the physician is telling us, and um, there's a lot more that they know that what's going on with the patient. Okay. All right. So that's that for, and then here's an example where this was overblocked, too much field in field. Um, and I did this just to illustrate, but this is too much blocking, and so we're running cold here. So this is one way we'd have to back off on the on the field in field and make sure that we recover the. Um, recover the, the coverage there. I'm just keeping my eye on the clock here. I think I have 15 minutes. Okay, so now I wanted to go on and talk about boost techniques. And um, so my talk today is all about intact press. I didn't talk about post mastectomy at all, but I want to talk about boost techniques because there's so many things that you can do. And the 
the key things we're looking for here is we want to minimize the amount of normal breasts that's receiving the full breast, uh, boost dose, right? Because we're trying to limit overall uh, the amount of breasts that will get the full composite dose, but we also want to minimize the lung and heart dose. And so depending on the uh, patient's geometry and the location of the seroma, there's a lot of different techniques that we can use for boosting these patients. So supine electron, I'm going to show examples for these supine electrons, lateral decube, and why we might do the lateral decubitus. I'll talk about mini tangents, uh, obliques, and then also a combination of mini tangents with electrons. And I'll be curious to know, as I present these techniques, which of these you're using um, um, as we go forward. Okay. So. Um, Let's go with the first one. So this is, uh, I would say the one we use the most or historically we used to use the most. We've done a lot of photons now, but electrons. Uh, the beauty of electrons is there's obviously the fall off of dose. So you're able to spare lung. And then you're also able to spare non-target breast tissue because you're, you're just limiting uh, to treating in this part. So for example, in this patient, if we had used mini tangents or some kind of photon arrangement, would have been treating a lot of breast tissue out here unnecessarily. So for this patient, we did straight, uh, this patient actually was on treatment that I just planned the other day. And um, so this is just a 9 MeV electron. We prescribed to the distal edge of the tumor. And then we check to make sure that the normalization ends up not being less than 80% of the, uh, not, it basically you're not like normalizing to less than 80% isodose line. So in this case, uh, this yellow is 110, that little thing there is 119, I think. But this was a four fraction boost. Uh, this patient was receiving Canadian fractionation. The Canadian protocol did not have a boost, but our physicians gave a four fraction boost of 250 centigrade. So this was an example. And so that's what we have. So we're able to spare all this breast tissue, all that breast tissue, and only focus on, on this area. Lateral decubitus. Sometimes we go lateral decube uh, based on if there's an unsuitable body contour or if the patient has a seroma that's so deep that we cannot reach it with a high electron energy. And even there, uh, different physicians have different requirements. I have physicians who are, who are okay going up to 20 MeV. Um, even though that gives you very high skin dose. Um, yeah, and you know, you're, you're also exiting into the lung quite a bit. Different preferences. But for lateral decube, the reason we, uh, one of the things that helps with this is that you flatten out the surface contour and then you're able to use a low electron energy because the distal depth of the seroma is reduced. So I am going to show one example here. Uh, this is a patient where the depth of seroma was 6.3 cm. This is our highest electron energy, it's 20 MeV. And we could not get um, the coverage back here. So 100% is this green line, this is post-normalization. This is 90% and then this is 80%. So this is after we've normalized, we still could not get um, the coverage. I think this was post-norm, I forget. Um, anyway, so we couldn't, really get the coverage back there. And so what we did, um, yes, this is post-norm. We uh, rolled her over, the depth reduced to four centimeters and we're able to use 12 MeV. So that's how we did that. Uh, the other thing to notice with the 20 MeV is look at, I, again, I don't have the isodose. I think this might be 10% line or 20% line all the way into the heart. Um, so we log rolled out. One of the disadvantages of doing this, of doing the lateral decubitus is we can't create a composite plan. It's so like we cannot uh, recreate and give the doctor the final metric. So that's just one downside, but I think this probably outweighs um, that disadvantage. Um, so let me see, is the dose limits for standard 1.82 gray fractionation or does it account for hypofractionated dose? Um, so the do I think I'm not sure I follow that question also. Uh, everything I presented so far was hype, was for hypofractionated uh, dose. Okay, I'll come back to the chat. All right, so that's um, lateral decubitus. And here's another one that needed lateral decube. This one is not really about the depth. Um, it's not a it's not very deep um, seroma, but just because of the shape, we couldn't, you know, you can't get the electrons to, um, to get you good coverage here just because of the much bigger uh, depth here. So they log rolled this patient, were able to flatten things out and, and were able to get in there. 
And um, and then here's a mini tangent boost. This patient had two separate seromas. Um, there was no way we were going to be able to get this with electrons and also just because of the shape uh, and also under the nipple. Uh, we don't think decupitus would have helped just because of how separated out the seromas were. So we just did mini tangents in this case. Works out fine because we're able to spare. We're not treating all this breast tissue here, right? But we are getting these higher doses um, out in the in the entry in the periphery. And I'm curious to know what techniques folks are using. So I'll check the chat in a little bit. Uh, here's another one: obliques or wedge pair. And so this is being this is this makes it very conformal. Uh, you have one beam that sort of exits into actually we're, we're sort of they're sort of kissing a little bit on the other contralateral side. And then you have this that's uh, that's arranged this way, and this allows you to basically have a very conformal distribution. Uh, so you're not getting full dose here like you would have if you had done mini tangent straight across. So you're able to avoid having full dose here, but you do exit to other parts that you probably wouldn't have treated. So that's the downside. Uh, but again, with the goal of limiting the amount of normal breast that gets full dose, sometimes we do use um, this kind of technique. And then uh, I'm just going to check the chat again here. Wedge pair obliques. Wedge. Okay. Okay. Dose constraint for contralateral breast. I don't know that we have a, a limit. I think we just visually, we turn on the low isodose lines and let the physician take a look and then they make a decision based on what's the gain um, in doing that. Um, what is the dose for the boost? Is it different for hyperfraction? That's a great question. So for the boost, it's um, for Canadian fractionation, we're doing a th one, 1,000 centigrade in four fractions, so 250 a fraction. And then the same for UK fast, we're also doing the same. Uh, so just four fractions. I've seen sometimes they give just three fractions depending on what's happening with the patient. So here's an example where we had to get creative. So this patient has a seroma right under the nipple. And if we had done just electron, this is what happens because that's how electrons behave with the scattering and you have this uh, um, basically a protrusion from the nipple. So we could not get the coverage there. And the physician, this patient is actually very small breasted. The physician did not want to just do straight tangents. I mean, straight mini tangents because we would have given full dose um, basically to a very large area to prescription dose. So they asked uh, to get creative. And so what I did is I put on an electron field and then mixed in with photons this way with wedges. And so we were able to sort of not have all the full dose. This is 90% line here instead of having 100% all the way. So she had very small breast. And so they're also worried about, um, you know, so small breast, even though the stroma doesn't look big, but it went, it extended quite a bit superiorly and inferiorly. So the whole breast would, would have gotten um, quite a bit of higher dose. So those are just some examples of techniques that we use for, for boosting these patients. It's no longer just a straight electron. And I'm going to pause there for, let me just look at the chat and see if there's any questions again. Do you use SIB technique frequently? That's a great question. We have done SIB um, not routinely, I know we were enrolled in, I think it was RTG1005, um, but I would say it's not standard for us right now. Um, how do we do simulation for breast boost? Great question. Um, a lot of times we're using the same scan that was used for the initial. Uh, a lot. Of, sometimes we rescan the patient. Uh, sometimes the seroma has shrunk, and so we're able to treat to a smaller volume. Uh, but if we're doing the cubitus, then obviously it's, it's a separate scan. But other than that, um, if we're just doing electrons and they're supine, that is the same as the way we sim them uh, for their tangents. And um, a lot of the patients, we are, we're doing the boost um, on the original scan. Uh, unless they had a very large seroma, then the physician will rescan, and then we have to plan on that one. A clips used to draw the boost sometimes. If the, if the clips are there, they're, they're included as part of the seroma volume. That's a great question. Okay. Um, are you using IMRT or VMAT? We're using VMAT for um, nodal patients. So when we're doing full axillary coverage, superclav, that's the one area we're using a VMAT. Um, yeah, so, but not for these uh, just intact breast. Okay, great questions. How about using IMRT plan, then plan some? Yeah, so I think, yeah, for our institution where we're just, if it's if it's VMAT, it's VMAT throughout. Um, um, yeah, 
as, as far as I can remember for right now. I think that's that's that. Okay, now let's talk about prone. Um, so this is indicated for large pendulous breast cases. This helps to reduce the skin pull, so they get less of a skin reaction. Uh, also reduces the lung dose, as we'll see. And I say it may lead to less heart dose because for some patients, we have seen that simming them in the prone position, for some of them, the heart actually sort of comes closer to the edge of the, to the field edge. So it's not a guarantee that prone treatment is going to reduce the heart dose. There's some ways we've seen it sort of fall, not into the field, but you know, it just depends on the anatomy. So we have seen that happening. So for these patients, we're gonna pro, uh, sim them. This is what it looks like. Um, where we actually tattoo, for these we do tattoo the patient still, they'll get one tattoo on the breast, another one back here for lining up and then two this way um, for straightening. Um, and then, so this is just an example of what the breast board looks like. We actually have switched to a different breast board. I haven't updated these slides, but I, you know, I, I, I can add those as I, as I, before I submit these. The contralateral breast is out of the way, um, sort of, um, um, compressed onto this other side. And what we see here is that the biggest advantage obviously with prone is that the breast tissue, because it's hanging down with gravity, it also it thins out. And so the separation is very small. And so in this example here, the 100% is that yellow and then 103% um, hotspot, so very low. So in this patient, the, the heart actually was spared quite a bit, I would say, that's the field edge. Um, so that's a big advantage for these patients. Um, and then here, I'm just showing an example. This is a patient that actually we just planned last week. She's getting UK fast. Um, I wanted to show this picture for some of the things to consider when you're treating with prone. So there's this insert where the contralateral breast lies. And so we have to watch that we don't, um, um, the density is actually not very high. Most of this is actually very low density material, but inside it, there's actually a high density um, material that I actually didn't show you if I changed the window and level would have seen it, but we have to consider that. And then we also have to, we include the couch in the planning. So this is just showing exit into the couch, but we also have to make sure that as we enter, um, that we're not cutting through the couch to get to this part of the breast tissue. Um, it will be accounted for in planning. So if that's why we actually include it, but we try and, create the angle so that we don't have too much going um, through the couch. Now, for some patients, if they're very large and the breast would end up touching the couch, we actually put a styrofoam. At the time of sim, we'll put a sort of like a little styrofoam cup so that they're not making contact with this um, higher density material. So the breast would actually just fall in that styrofoam cup and be held up um, that way. So those are just some things to think about with prone um, is to see where you're where you're entering and where you're exiting. Um, so it's some different considerations. Um, and then I'm going to talk about um, IGRT, uh, different protocols in different hospitals. There's options for KV imaging for verifying the isocenter. Uh, there's also uh, MV portal imaging weekly and then uh, surface imaging use, using vision RT. So here's an example of MV portal images. We take these weekly, at least once a week, every patient gets a weekly portal image uh, of all of the, at least the open tangents. And so, um, so here's the DRR and there's the, um, the MV port. Uh, we also use um, Vision RT, which is an op uh, op optical surface imaging. So this is an example um, for breath hold. So here's the surface while they're free breathing and there's these tolerances. Um, that are set by, we actually have different tolerances of what's considered acceptable. So once the position, this is vertical, longitudinal, and, lat and latitude, if the patient is within those limits, then we'll treat. So this means they are taking the same breath that was taken at the time of SIM. So that's what we're using. Uh, but we're also using visual NRT basically just for all our patients. So as I said, we're not tattooing the patients at all. So we're only using visual NRT um, on the MGH side of the house. Um, and then a couple of things I just wanted to mention, quality issues. This is nothing special with hypofractionated, but it's just general. A couple of things here. So this patient has aroma was very high. Um, so we ended up doing pretty high tangents. You can see we actually caught a little bit of humoral head, uh, is to watch out for the arm. So for this patient, I'm just showing here that we actually added MLCs here because her arm is right there. 
And as you know, patients relax during treatment. If we hadn't done that, you know, the arm could creep down more. So she had mobility problems. So we actually added blocks and that's why you can see that there. Um, in this same patient for the other field, we had to worry about her chin. So again, our fields went very high. Here's her chin. And so uh, what we ended up doing is during treatment, we asked the, uh, the therapist to just have her move her chin a little bit higher. The therapist just had not realized how high this field were going to go. So we had her just move her chin up um, a little bit. So these are just some things that we, you know, things to watch out for that you may not know. The plan might look good, but reality could be different. And then other quality issues with breath hold is, you know, to make sure that, you know, the patient is still taking consistent breaths throughout. Are they tolerating well? Uh, just last week, we had, to we had to replan a case. Patient had gone through one week of treatment and for whatever reason, either anxiety or what, she just could not hold a breath anymore. Um, and so she was replanned using free breathing. Um, then there's also breast swelling. Uh, sometimes you have to replan to increase flash. So that's why when I plan, I use, I use 3CM because I don't want to have to replan to add 1CM of flash. Um, and that basically is my last slide and it's 1047. So I'm going to stop there and look at the chat again. Uh, what's the rationale behind doing a KV MV pair for breast setup? I know some also do an ant KV and a post oblique MV imaging. Um, so I didn't say KV MV, I said KV KV. Uh, that's just to verify isocenter. We actually are not even doing that anymore. Um, we're just taking the ports and then vision RT. But before that, that's what we used to do: take an orthogonal pair to verify isocenter and then take the the ports of the actual fields. Uh, if we don't have breastboard, how to simulate and treat pendulous breast patients. I had taken out some slides. There's some devices out there. You can do a breast, um, like a breast cup or breast bra that um, basically compresses the breast and holds it a little bit up. I actually took those out because I didn't think it was relevant for this, for this lecture, but I could add it back to the slide. Or someone said prone. If you don't have a breastboard for prone, I don't think that you can simulate if you don't have the board. As far as I can tell, I'm mm -hmm. sorry to say that. All right, should I stop? I can't see the, let me um, go back and show the controls. Okay, I think yeah. that's all I have. All right, uh, thank you very much, Jackie. Mm -hmm. um, I think now we'll throw it open for discussion. Um, all the questions you have, I would have some panelists with us. Um, first person here is Dr. Yan um, Susu. She's a medical physicist with the Mass General um, Hospital, as well as a faculty at Harvard Medical School. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Rebecca Boeka, who is a radiation oncologist in Germany. She's based in Germany. She um, successfully ran the diaspora tumor board, all, all from Germany and involving Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, other persons we have with us, I'm sure you already know Dr. Saifu Hawk, who is the Director of uh, Medical Physics at University of Pittsburgh. And so it's open, please. Um, that's Fallon Chipiza, not Omori Irabor. Um, I don't know why my name is on her screen. <laughs> that's a Zoom problem. But anyway, so we have all of them here on board. Ahmad Nobar is also here, um, a physicist. And we have um, uh, Bashkim Zibeli all the way from uh, Moldova. So I think we start with the panelists now. And I think we may just have to start with the questions um, coming from the group. If we don't mind. There's a question here that says, is hyperfractionation, in hyperfractionation, did we avoid using breast mass due to high skin dose? Hmm. Not very sure if someone wants to chip in there. I don't even know what the breast mask is. Yeah, ah. I, I, can, I can comment on that. There, there is a, and I, you know, I took out all these slides. I didn't think that, I wish I had left them in, but um, there is a, um, a uh, thermoplastic mask that's used can be used for breast patients to basically reduce the folds, inframammary fold, and so it you know it holds the, the the breast in position. And yes, depending on the material that that it's made of, it could increase uh, skin dose. Okay, mm -hmm. sounds good. So that's like the mold, I guess. It's it's molded just the same way you do the face mask for head and neck tumors. Yes, yes, okay. basically. I'll, I can look for, you can go ahead and I can maybe show a picture in a little bit. <laughs> okay. Um, next question is, is helica tomography convenient for breast and chest wall? 
You want to go there, Jacqueline, or Chipiza? I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, it's helicot tomography. I, yeah, tomotherapy, I think maybe. maybe tomotherapy is, is, is tomotherapy. payment by tomotherapy, maybe. Yeah, if it's, I, I have never heard of that being used. Maybe I've not had enough exposure, but I haven't heard of uh, tomotherapy being used for breast cancer or chest wall. Just you know, curious the, if anyone has had that experience. The, the issue here, I think, is that the tomotherapy is a bit of a slow system so that it's um, using the helical, uh, so slide by slide. So if there will be like for chest wall, I would say it may be a bit, um, uh, dangerous, I would say, not dangerous, I, mean, I would say a bit of risky because the breathing will be, you know, moving while the treatment may be a bit of uh, slow. Uh, so, so motion management is not taken, is not taken into consideration here. Uh, but when it comes to, for example, other systems that can, that uses bone beam uh, delivery uh, nature, so the whole target will be at the same beams I view when radiation is coming out. So all target will be irradiated. But for tomotherapy, I think it's a bit, despite the fact that it's it's amazing system uh, in terms of uh, controlling the dose, uh, uh, the, 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 the dose in the dose spill in the axial as well as uh, tumor coverage. So, but again, like sometimes you care about the case in terms of motion management, it's a bit limited system. Okay. So just want to note here that um, Saifu Hawk is a co-moderator here on this um, panel. So you may sure. as well ask your questions and yeah. Thanks, Credit. Uh, there has been actually, we have a great panel and lots of great presentations, lots of great qu questions uh, from the floor. So maybe a couple of questions, you know, this is a session on quality management. Uh, a couple of questions, maybe start with our physician colleagues here. Uh, Patient compliance is important, right? Uh, and when you select the patient, and uh, Dr. Fallon, you showed for the early stage breast cancer patient, there's a lot of possibilities as to how, how to choose a particular uh, uh, dose fractionation and for a given patient. And you just touched on this small component, you know, just early stage. And there are like four trials you have shown there, many other trials. I'm not a fan of compiling data because they evolve with time, but for early stage, say for example, radiation oncologists or residents around the world, you know, are there any data or a compilation of data where uh, it's like a cookbook? Again, I'm not a fan of cookbooks, so, so that they can go and say that these are the clinical parameters and this is a good guidance to treat, you know, the moderated fractionation or ultra high fraction hyperfractionation or whole breast. Are there such resources available? Hmm. So I think the best, that's a great question because um, I feel like, you know, with data, it's always a moving target. Um, you know, three years from now, this talk would look very different and it's really hard to keep track of things. So um, I think the best go-to, what I would recommend, you know, just as a good starting place, um, Astro actually publishes a lot of consensus guidelines and they're really, really good and they are sort of applicable to different settings. So, you know, everything that we discussed today, for example, you know, who's the right patient for a boost? Uh, you know, when do you, you know, do hypofrac? Uh, there's actually a very nice Astro consensus guideline that was, I think it was last updated in 2018. And I think it's due for another update because when it was published, we didn't even have the fast forward data. So I think that's a good place to start, like going on the Astro website, going on the breast subsite and looking at the consensus guidelines. Um, and then in terms of books, there are just so many resources out there. Um, there's one book that I like, I can send a, a picture of it maybe to the group, which is very, it's very simple. It's very precise. It's sort of up to date. Uh, let me see if I have a copy here. Um, I can't find it, but um, I can send. It's a very, um, I think the author is Dr. Zaworski, is the one of the first authors, and it's like a general, a good starting point. So 
I don't know about other panelists, but it's it's hard to keep track of things. I agree with you. It's really hard. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And I, I agree with you and I caution everybody around the world who are listening to this. This is a moving target. And, and that's why I'm also not a fan of you know creating tables, but you know, keeping that in mind, it's probably a good thing for particularly folks who are not as experienced uh, to see where do I get started as a starting point. Yeah. Next question will be, uh, you know, you've talked about uh, hypofractionation, ultra hypofractionation, and you have as a physician, you have the intent, say, for example, you want to treat a patient with a, in the ultra hypofractionation regime, right? Six grade times five. So you're treating the uh, lumpectomy cavity. How do you communicate that to your uh, you know, simulation people or to the, uh, the planners? Because the isocenters will be very different. And, and if that communication is not done correctly, your intention is to treat, say for example, with ultra hypofractionation and the communication is not right, the same people could be simming up for a whole breast. Now, the isocenters are very different and you actually can end up treating the patient very differently. Um, let me know if anybody else wants to chip in. I don't want to hog, but um, so, you know, and Jackie, please comment on the MGH workflow, but you know, at, at the Brigham, you know, we have protocols, we have workflows. So in our clinic, you know, once we know that a patient is coming for simulation, there are sort of tasks that um, you know, and we use ARIA, you know, for our RVS system, there are sort of tasks that need to be done. Uh, for example, you know, the SIM will not simulate a patient before I put in a prescription in ARIA. And once there's a prescription based on the policies that we've been able to build in our clinic, they know, okay, Dr. Chpizza put in this patient as a, a fast forward, then they go to the protocol, how do we SIM this patient? So I think it's an important question that you're asking and it goes back to the question of like good uh, practice building, you know, because, you know, our specialty, there are so many technical parts, like you have to have a rubric, you have to have a framework, you have to have a policy, you know, and, and it's, it's teamwork. I couldn't be able to do the work that I do without, you know, input from physics, from dissymmetry, you know, from nursing. So I think the question is more, you know, practice building um, and having policies in place to make sure that those errors don't don't happen. You don't want to call back a patient and re them. So that's how we do it in our clinic. And, and Jackie, maybe you can talk about the MGH workflow, how you avoid those issues. Um, yeah, so it's very similar, actually. We have guidelines and different protocols uh, based on um, once the physician has put in the prescription, it goes to, I think in ARIA, call it a care path, but it's very similar. Um, I know that for, on the Brigham side, I know you're placing, I don't know if that's still the case, you're placing ISO center right at the time of SIM, right, with the physician present. Now at MGH, we're doing it a little bit differently. Uh, the physicians are not placing ISO center. We place it after, like in planning, but the physician has to approve the beams, the original beam geometry before I start doing field in field. So in that sense, they've already reviewed what I'm going to do, my intent, before I go too far down the line. Um, and then other things that we're starting to implement are peer review, uh, just among the dosimetrists as well, um, just to make sure that we're checking on things. So I would say, yes, just having the protocols and different guidelines and everybody's on the same page on what the expectations are. Um, so that's that's what we're doing. Uh, it doesn't mean errors don't happen, but they're few and far between. These are important recommendations and we have viewers from all over the world. And I know uh, there are protocols uh, in, in many uh, centers all over the world, but I just wanted to emphasize this important component hearing from you to all the uh, listeners that that communication is key. Even in the best possible scenarios, we have seen these errors to happen. And when they happen, they, they really can impact the patient uh, severely. So that communication among the team and establishing policies and the protocols, you know, it may not exist everywhere, but that's the message I wanted everybody to hear from you that it's critical you know, for patient safety. And I, I have uh, quite a few questions I wanted to ask, uh, but credit jump in and somebody probably is uh, watching the chat. 
uh, jump in. Um, I will ask one other question before maybe giving it to credit. Uh, for the, you know, there's a lot of discussion about uh, you know, moderate fractionation, but this again, a lot of folks are practicing uh, ultra hypofractionation. You know, the for the ultra hypofractionation, and like again, when you're treating the cavity, in many cases, you do not see the cavity on the planning CT images. So, yes. as a physician, the question to the physicians: How do you contour? You know, what goes through your mind? You know, as you're trying to contour that, and if you don't see the cavity well. Uh, what do you do in those cases? And how do you validate that in the treatment machine when maybe there are limitations with cone beam CT and you can do only orthogonals? So when I do ultra hyperfractionation, if you look at the protocol from fast and fast forward, we actually recommend contouring the PTV eval. Um, and you know, we, we put a little margin, which we plan around, you know, because of the penumbra, and then we evaluate coverage on the PTV EVO. Um, in my practice, I don't routinely do a boost when I'm, my patients that I'm treating with fast forward, they are low risk, they are patients that I otherwise wouldn't boost, they're all elderly at this point. But I know that in the protocol, you know, in the UK, they did allow a boost on some of the studies, you know. So you end up doing the five fractions plus another five fraction boost. So it's a little bit longer. And then it gets challenging because if you can't see the seroma and you don't have clips, then it's hard. But I haven't had that issue. Um, if I have a patient in clinic who needs a boost, but I can't quite see the seroma, um, then you're going back to the pathology report, to the mammogram. You're trying to find out was the tumor in the upper inner quadrant or upper outer quadrant, and then you're contouring that area more generously and boosting a larger area. But um, typically, we don't run into that issue. Hmm. Thank you very so, much. Uh, thank you. There's a question on why it would uh, be different as a center of choice if the case is treated conventional or hypofractionation. I was talking about accelerated partial breast, ultra hypofractionation is what I was referring to. And so you're really treating, treating the cavity as a six gray, uh, times five fractions. And we actually have had cases where it was very difficult to see the cavity. And, and, and so what our physicians would do in those cases is, uh, you know, try to uh, consult other uh, images and really increase the margin. So it's a it's a the catch twenty two. You want to minimize the margin to reduce the toxicity, and yet you cannot see the cavity well. So you have to increase the margin. So it's a lot of uh, you know a lot of thought process go in there. Uh, yeah. So uh, questions from the floor. Let me check. Uh, yeah, uh, credit. Are you here. following? Yep. Uh, there's a question here. Can you read maybe Rish the question? Credit from. Yeah, I can. Can you hear me? Can everyone yep, hear yep. me? Okay. Yes. So there's a question here saying, um, I'm not sure what this um, stands for, but it says, um, how, how about using IMPT plan? I don't know if that was IMRT, I guess. The patient, I'm oh, sorry. The, intensity modulated proton. proton. Oh, proton. Oh, you meant intensity modulated proton plan. Okay. I think I'll leave that for those with proton. <laughs> that would be Jackie. Yeah. <laughs> Jackie, yeah, I, I still deal with photon in my place here. Yeah, so we do you we do give uh, use protons for, uh, but usually it's for um, when you're treating the regional nodes, the axillary and the superclav, and then a mm. lot of patients with um, expanders as well, so post mastectomy. But we're not using protons, to my knowledge, for just intact breast. Um, Great, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm not sure if there's any trial that has shown any difference, you know. Um, in outcome between proton and photon in the breast setting. Yeah, there's a there's a trial that's running RADCOMP that's still accruing right. and that is comparing uh, photon proton. So, but it's still running, still accruing. Oh, thanks. Um, next question says: Are the implant silicon treated as the same for those with implanted silicon? Are they treated as the same? Yep. I think this probably will go to Chipita. Um, sorry. So they're asking, you know, and I guess, I guess, that's yeah, the silicon. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of data actually that has been published on outcomes between, you know, autologous implants versus silicon implants. 
Um, some data suggests that you know the the risk of failure is less with autologous versus with a silicon. Um, but they're all retrospective. Most of it has come come out of uh, Canada. But from our perspective, when I'm seeing that patient in clinic, I don't do anything different um, depending on the implant that they have. So I don't know if that's what they would ask. Yeah. Jackie, do you do anything different when you plan to do symmetry? The only comment I can make is in terms of artifacts when we have, like, but that's really more the expanders. Um, right. And right. you know, sometimes the, it makes it a challenge if the if the implant is very big, we cannot get clearance to come in on the other side. So sometimes they have to go back and have the have it sort of taken out so that we can treat the patient. So that's that's sort of the extreme that I've seen. But planning wise, we it's we just look for if there's artifacts and we override them. And that's all I can. That's I, I think that's what the person is asking. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. There was a question. Um, about would you consider ultra hypofractionation if you don't have a breath hold technique? Any comment from uh, any of the panelists on that? I mean, I don't know, Chip, is that what you think? But if the woman meets the criteria, if she's, you know, the fast and fast forward regimen criteria, I think I can do that. Yeah, they didn't mandate a breath yeah. hold on fast and fast forward. Um, and you know, typically we do it on the for left-sided breast cancers, but I have noticed that if I'm doing fast or fast forward in a seroma that's more high riding, like in the upper outer quadrant, um, it actually makes a difference. Uh, even if it's a right-sided breast cancer, to have them do a breath hold, you can actually, if they're able to maintain it, it actually helps a little bit with the lung dose, but it's not required. You don't have to do a DIBH um, in order to do the fast or the fast forward. Um, a, question a couple from... of the things I'll add to that is that, um, so uh, let me see. I will add a couple of the comments to that. Uh, DIBH is really important, you know, for left-sided breasts, right? And, and, and so um, it, it depends also on where your lumpectomy cavity is. If your lumpectomy cavity is uh, more medial and close to the heart, DIA, you would do DIBH, but then DIBH causes additional uncertainties potentially because you know, if the patient is not taking the breath hold, deep inspiration breath hold to the same level, which sometimes is a problem for many patients and is not able to maintain that, then you'll have to incorporate that uncertainty in the overall treatment process. You know, so that's, you know, so sometimes when you look at the imaging then, because you know you're doing yes all these plans, but you do your um, the orthogonal imaging MV or KV that you really need to, and you don't see much on those images. So to be to make sure that you are uh, covering the cavity in your ultra fractionation, particularly when the cavity is in a, close to the heart in a, anteriorly, you need to uh, make sure that you have lots of margin in there to uh, incorporate the target in your uh, treatment field. One other comment I will make is when you are doing ultra fractionation, it is critical that you do image guidance for every fraction that you deliver. Without image guidance, I will not consider uh, doing ultra fractionated radiation therapy, period. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seipel. Um, I think the panel is open to all the other panelists as well. You can say anything you want to say at this point. Um, Susu, Ian, and Rebecca Boca. Um, so there are a couple of questions still coming here. Um, this is from Sahar. Um, and he's asking, if you have a VMAT plan, um, do you add more margins for breast-free breathing? Uh, I'm not very sure I understand the question very well. If you have a VMAT plan, do you add more margins for breast-free breathing? If you, I, I guess it means if you're using the free breathing technique. Yeah, so I, I don't know if don't... they're talking about a PTV margin, if you're doing a PTV on the breast. Um... Yeah, it's likely a PTV. You know, if, 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 if I understood the question right, maybe she is saying that, for example, for Eclipse, 
there are some limitations when it comes to the to including the 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 border of the breast during the breathing so you know it it moves up and down so for eclipse for example the the flash technique cannot be implemented for vmat but it can be implemented in imrt so there are some work around that maybe we can share it with uh, with with sahar in the future uh, some references uh, some literature they have some kind of work around how to extend for example the the body and some of them are extending the ptv but at the same time it's more or less like a way that you can uh, like a trick that can be used but uh, for during the optimization process but during the dose calculation uh, it should not be uh, the, the, the exact CT setup should be used for those calculation to replicate the exact setup on the treatment. But for optimization purposes, uh, the MLC needs to be a bit away from the border of the breast to, to take into consideration, into consideration the movement of the breast. But if she used IMRT, then she can add an external margin so that MLC will always be open during the delivery. But of or course, other, add... other treatment planning system like Monaco, they can include the flash. They have the flash option for VMAT, but, but not Eclipse and VMAT. But as you said, right. comment for, you know, for that IMRT plan, if the uh, target is pretty close to the skin, you know, the, the jaws are automatically set up pretty close to the skin. So you can add in artificial, say, in a, a structure so that the, uh, the MLC, they all get pushed out and the optimization and dose calculation are more accurate in that case. All right, uh, I would just love to run through some statement made here. Um, as Sif Nesai said, boost is omitted whenever tumor cavity is not discernible and there are no clips. Huh, that's a hard one, but of course, if you don't have the tumor cavity, I don't think you have anything to boost because that's exactly where you want to boost. I don't know what if you would meet it or you go you know, check the preoperative imaging, talk to the breast surgeon, and try to design where it is. It's customary for the breast surgeon to try to place clips when they resect, when they do the surgery. But if, you know, I, I've had a case like this where we literally had no clips and were unable to design the um, tumor cavity. But again, we walked backwards, looked at the preoperative images and uh, spoke to the breast surgeon to discern it. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. Um, there is Hola. some other question here. I think this we already answered. Would you consider ultra hypofractionation if you don't have breath holding technique? I think that was Dr. Seifel's question already answered. Uh, what is the dosimetry effect of field in field technique on moving targets while using free breathing technique? So what is the dosimetry effect of field in field um, on the moving targets when using free breathing technique? I think that's a nice question, but I don't think it can be easily uh, measured because, you know, for two reasons. The first thing is that the field and field is too short. And also most of the time, the, the amount of MUs that you're considering, it's considered to be like between four, five, six MUs. So maybe it's a bit challenging to measure something like that due to the fact that the dose is, is, is a small amount and also during breathing, I think it's, it's a, it can be a good study, but it requires a good amount of uh, care, like care has to be taken, like yeah. uh, cautiously. It's not, it's not that easy, but it's a good question. Yeah. I think uh, in some treatment planning system, you can maybe simulate uh, the, the motion and also then see the effect of the dose, but, but not all the system probably has the ability. So that is definitely a good, way to simulate and see how much the dose could be affected by the free breathing. All right, thank you. Yeah, but, but I think here, doctor- It's a good it, study for the- for... It's a good study. It's good because maybe if, if they can- say... Maybe if they can do the plan, at, like if they can consider like a 4D CT and then do the same plan on different phases, I think this way you can quantify 100% the effect yeah. of the field and field. But if you are using only one static static uh, phase, that will be a bit difficult. Mm. Yes, I was going to suggest the, the person uh, who raised this question, it's a good study for them to go and do it. And yeah. maybe write yeah. it up as a paper. Yeah. 
So I think I'll just entertain one more question, unfortunately. Um, this is coming from Nkuli Laba, and she's asking, do you use 5.2 gray for boost in ultra hypofractionated treatments during the, um, I think, ultra hypofractionation? Do you, I mean, the question I think should be, do you even boost at all? <laughs> Chip is up. I, when I'm doing ultra hypofract, I'm not boosting, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I agree. I think patients who are candidates for ultra hypofractionation are probably not candidates. Credit, for I would state. like to. I would like to add it. Yes, I, I can. A credit here. This is a good question, and I would like to add a, a quality management uh, comment here. You know, this is probably the uh, person who's asking the question is probably thinking of fast forward trial. Uh, um, the when you display the isodosis in, in that trial, uh, in a 5.2 gray times five fraction versus whole breast, if you display the uh, is dose distribution as isodosis, you do not know whether you are treating the patient with a uh, 5.2 gray per fraction or you're treating with a you know, whole breast dose, you know, a 40 gray and 15 fraction. So it's important to display the dose distribution in absolute doses rather than in the percentages that, that we are used to, so that you, there is no room for making an error. Yeah. All right, thank you everyone. I appreciate your time. Uh, I will now hand it over to Dr. Avery, Stephen, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Ahmed as a to give us the last comments um, as we close for the day. Thank you. I think Ahmed is going to say a few comments and then I will mention um, some comments about the course next week. So Ahmed, why don't you go first? If he's still here. This is me to speak? Yeah. Closing comments. Yes. yes. I am very glad today because of the start of this course. God bless you all. Because when we speak about increased affordability of better value cancer care, and when we in, in speak about hypofractionation, okay, this is not uh, enough. This needs to how to do well and how to spread the knowledge everywhere in the world. And in the same time, I am honored really by uh, knowing all of you to that you, you for the time that you are uh, uh, sacrificed for our younger colleagues everywhere who lead these fields everywhere in the world, why they, they are there. Second thing, quickly, we, in the Global Oncology University, we encourage comments, feedback, suggestion, idea, even if you find it crazy, send it to, to us and we receive it and we discuss it together. Maybe you suggest a good, something good for us, maybe, you, you, you improve uh, uh, us, we learn from each other, even if I am uh, an old colleague like me, okay? <laughs> I learn every day. Thank you all and God bless you all. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Azawi. Uh, so we'd like to thank our speakers today. I think this, again, just to um, just piggyback on his comments, this was a great start to, to the course. I think they gave great discussions excellent questions from our participants. Also, I'd like to thank our panel. Next week, we will be talking about cervical cancer, uh, which will be hosted by University of Pennsylvania. We'll have speakers um, from University of Pennsylvania, as well as speakers um, who are working in, in Botswana. And so I think it'll be another great session. I hope all you can join us next week. And I look forward to seeing you here again. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. This was a rich session. I had a lot to learn. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.